All right, let's do this. All right, so today we're going to talk about orthogonal transformations. So we looked at a specific case last time. Uh, we had um, two Cartesian axes, and they were rotated with respect to each other. So this allowed us to describe the, uh, the position and the rotation, or the, I guess, the rotation of a rigid body. So we're going to generalize this. And so instead of using x, y, and z, we're going to use x1, x2, and x3. So the axis is given by the index. One, two, three, and so on. Although we'll only look at three dimensions today. Um, this notation is convenient, we'll see why. Also, just because we're really lazy, uh, instead of writing out cosine theta, ij, we're going to use just letter a with the indices. So remember that i, so the first index, was the prime system. So this was the original one, x x1, x2, and x3. And the prime one is over here. So you know we're gonna put it at the origin as well. And so maybe x was over here, y over here, and you know, z rotated a little bit. This one was x1 prime, x2 prime an x3 prime. Can you see this well enough? Yeah, right? Because you're in a, in a column, so you could rearrange yourself into a more entropic position. So then this angle over here is theta what? One, one. What about this one over here? One, one what? One, two. What about this one? OK. 
can. This one, um, let me see. Yeah, this one over here. Two, three, and so on. So it seems like we get it. So before we had we use this relationship x1 prime was vector r that I had prime that was equal to um, would be x1 cosine theta 1 1 plus x2 instead of y cosine theta uh, 1 2 this one is x3 cosine theta 1 3 and so on right we had x2 will be uh, j so it'll be x1 cosine theta 2 1 x2 cosine theta 2 2 x3 cosine theta 2 3 and z will be this one prime so x1 cosine theta 3 1 x2 cosine theta 3 2 x3 cosine theta 3 3 if we write this in our new notation with the um, ij's um, I guess I will rewrite it over here, smaller. So this one will be A11 X1 A12 X2 A13 X3 1 Two, three. So this one is going to be two one, three one, two two, two three, three two, three three, two three. Ah, uh, sorry, one one. Two, two, three, three. So this is a in this particular case that we're going to look what makes it like this. This is a linear transformation. What makes it linear? There is no, no x. No x. Linear terms. There is no linear terms. Are there linear terms in here? Which ones? X multiplied to x. Each one of these is a linear term, right? Mm -hmm. I have the x or y, z. So in order for it, I guess for the system of equations to be um, linear, what is the condition or what is the requirement on the A's?
we already have the linear terms, the x, y, and z. So um, a's must be independent of x. Right? Otherwise, we'll have x squared or something else. So it should be independent of um, x and x prime. Okay. So this one is equation in um, Goldstein 4.12. It has some interesting properties um, which we will prove. But first, we are going to express those rules, I guess that system of equations more compactly. Okay, so we're going from these to these. That one, keep in your, your head. We're going to use the Einstein notation. And um, yeah, it was invented by that guy. I don't know. Semi semi famous. Um, so the rule for the Einstein notation is that if the indices are repeated. That means that there is a sum. So implicitly, I guess it's not implicitly, it's just a rule. Um, sum over um, all values of the index. So who has heard about the Einstein notation and who has used it? Heard about it? Used it? Where? Uh, general relativity? I guess so. Um, so this one, the system of equations, we're going to write it as this. X i prime equals a i j x j for uh, j equals 1, 2, and 3. So the Einstein notation, um, I'm not really used to it. I think you have to work with it for a while to like really digest it. So we're gonna look at several examples. Uh, so this expresses one of them, right? So. Um, is i, so it's going to be 1, 2, or 3, but j, uh, it's all of them because it includes x1, x2, and x3. This one is prime, this one is not prime, and this is the order. So the i, I mean the, well, yeah, the i, the first index belongs to the prime system, 
and the second index belongs to the uh, unprimed system. So J, J, I, I. So we are rewriting that. Um, and so let's see, for the repeated values. Um, I guess we don't really need this stuff to see where it's coming from. Well, I guess what it gives rise to. So for i equals 1, so for this one, um, the repeated value is j equals what? For i equals 1, j equals 1, right? So then we're going to have x1 prime equals um, a1 j xj. Well, I guess this is this one in general. So the repeated value is going to be 1. <clears throat> so when the repeated value is 1, um, it is, we're going to sum over all the values of the index. So it's going to be sum over j, a1, j, x, j. So this is a1, 1, x1, which is this term, a1, 2, x2 and a13 x3 right it takes um, some work to get used to it so let's replace it yes um Let's look at the, at the next example. Actually, let's look at all of them. Um, I was going to replace it, but let's rewrite it. Uh, well, but I want this one. It's okay. It's, uh, so for i equals 2, the repeated value is going to be j equals 2. So it's going to be x2. Right, so we have the i prime. Um, we're going to have a two j x j. But now j is over all the possible values. So now we're going to have the a two j x j, and this is. I'll put it over here. A two one x two. Ah, uh, wait, x one. A two two x two. A two three x three. So we're always, in this particular case, with the arrangement that we have, we will always have a repeated value. The repeated value is going to be whatever we have over here. So this one's going to be a3j 
xj. So now the repeated value is going to be with 3. a3, j, x, j. So a3, 1, x, 1. a3, 2, x, 2. And a3, 3, x, 3. Right, so with the rule that if the indices are repeated, in this case, you always have some repeated indices, sum over all the possible values of the index, you recover the system of equations. So then you can express that whole idea here with that. Okay, so we're gonna uh, continue working with the Einstein notation. Um, actually, not just in this lecture, but uh, the rest of the semester. So we're gonna get used to it. Uh, you don't have to get you don't have to get it today, uh, but you have to start thinking about it. Okay. Um, <coughs> Yes. Okay, so I just noticed that um, the linear transformation is the same as the Einstein uh, notation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the point. Okay. That we can express it as this. Um, okay. So we're gonna look at a corner case. So this is a rule. Remember it. So if we have x i, x i, then the indices are repeated and we are going to, this is going to look like sum. over all i x i squared. So this one is um, for three dimensions it's going to be x 1 squared plus x 2 squared plus x 3 squared. So these can represent uh, the magnitude of a vector. So let's call it R. Uh, squared, right? So you have this one plus this one plus this one. Okay, let's, what part should I get rid of? Let's keep this one here, because that one is the, the most important one. So linear transformations a 
these are ones that we're uh, interested in right now. Mm. Let me think about how I say this. I guess there are two ways to say it and both are correct. So linear transformations leave uh, the vector that you're transforming uh, invariant. So this means that they're not going to change the magnitude of the vector. But you can also say that the linear transformations themselves are invariant. And uh, we'll see why. You know, the point right now is that mathematically, we can say that we can express this condition as x um, i prime, x i prime equals x i x i, right? So we saw that this is the, the magnitude of the vector. This is well, the magnitude of the of the vector, but this is in the prime system and this is in the unprimed system. Is it the same vector? Yeah? Should you have the same origin or the graph? Yeah. So you know, we'll see in a little bit in more detail, but you can think about the whole thing as you have this um, you have this vector over here. I'll call it R, and you can rotate your frame of reference with your system, like so. Now it looks like this. Right, so now this is the prime system. But this vector didn't change. It's actually the same vector in space. You can just represent it, and you know, the, the components change because now it's in the, um, prime, in the prime system. The other way to think about it, which is also correct, is to say, well, I have my system and I rotate the vector. So now this vector is over here. We'll see that both are correct. So that's what I'm trying to say here about the transformations and about the vectors. So we have that condition over there for xi, and we have this one over here. So we're going to spell it out. So this is going to be, so I'm going to put it over here. That's exactly the same as the first one. Um, and then this one um, is going to have the same structure, but not necessarily. Actually, the index has to be different. 
this is kind of like a dummy index. Uh, this is still i because it's the one that we have over here, so the same as this one. But now, instead of calling it j, we're going to call this one k, and then we're going to have x k. Um, this is equal to, I guess we could change this one like that. So this is xi and xi. These are the prime ones. So if j is equal to k, some double k, then we're going to have sum of j a i j x j times it's a, um, multiplication the one and the other one this one is also going to be j because that is our condition So this is equal to xj, xj, we have this one and this one, everything's multiplying, sum is um, multiplication, aij, and this one is also, well, over all chain, aij. So here, we only have one option, it's going to be xj, xj. A I J because J has to be equal. Well, these two have to be equal, and this is A I K. And so these. leaves us with this term over here. This one is equal to this. So xi prime xi prime. So if we want to leave the vector invariant, what can we say about this term? So I'm going to write it over here. I hope you can still see it. So this is a i j a i k equals one. This is i i. This is j and k. But you know, for this particular case, J and K are the same. So this is for the case J equals K. So if J, I'm going to use the same mm, template, I guess. If J is different than K, then we still have the 
So I have all of these. So, but now this one is going to be k to make it explicit that j and k are different. Okay. So then over here we're going to have x, j, k. This one is, oh, this is j. This one is going to be k. This one's going to be k. So this is j is my plus k. Now we have j is different than k. Okay. So that's why we're replacing it in here. So this one is k times j and k because the one remains the same. And in this case, is this going to be true? Looking at the rule. This has to be equal to zero. So essentially, we have um, the Einstein notation summing over everything. But some things are true, like this one. And some things, we actually don't want those terms because they are um, they don't express reality. So we can eliminate them by making them zero. But in order to do that, we need a condition here. So this one has to be equal to what? Zero. To zero. So then if j is different than k, um, a i j a i k equals zero. Okay. So we have this if j equals k and this if j is different than k. because I guess we're crazy about saying everything with one equation. Can we express this as one single equation? Yeah. So then we're gonna say, um, I'm gonna use the red one. So it's gonna be A, if I write slowly, it's a little thicker. I J A I K equals Kronecker delta. Um, it's going to be J K. So for J. equals one, two, three. So the you know, x, y, and z. So this is kind of crazy, no? That we can express, I mean, the idea is not complicated, but there's a lot of you know, mathematical machinery, and yet we can just say it like that. So Kronecker was a horrible guy, by the way. He was against uh, Cantor, and I guess he held math steady for like, I don't know, two decades or something. I don't know. He said that. 
God created integers and that the rest was the work of man. And I guess he hated man. <laughs> so he didn't think that things like irrational numbers existed, which is kind of crazy. But anyways, um, so this one is equation 4.15 in uh, Goldstein. Cool. So I guess this sums up what we did last time. It's working. <clears throat> Let's go in the other direction to see what we get. I guess we already expressed this and this over here, so I'm gonna get rid of it. You know, also the Kronecker Delta, such a simple idea, I don't think it should have a name. Don't you agree? Maybe you hate Kronecker? <laughs> I don't. It's just like, you know, when I heard that this is like name after someone, I'm like, yeah. It's cool if you have like, you know, general relativity name after you. But this is like, I don't know. Well, I guess he was the integers guy. Um, okay, so, oops. Gotta hurry up. A I J Maybe I hate him and I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I was uh, an undergrad here, I took in university, so maybe some of you took that class. And it was for, I guess, science majors. And, but it was given by a philosophy professor. And so it was basically about Cantor and Cantor's ideas. And, you know, Cantor discovered, well, I guess, a lot of set theory, you know, but also, he discovered that there are infinites that are bigger than other infinites, right? So Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph 0, all of that stuff. And, you know, that's a precursor to stuff like, um, like Gödel's theorem, right? So this is, he, he was, I think, much more important than uh, Kronecker, but Kronecker, so Cantor never got like a faculty position in his lifetime because Kronecker was really powerful and stopped that from happening. But actually, we should stop, okay. Um, so AIJ cosine AJ. So this one, we're gonna write it as cosine IJ cosine, well, Theta. I J cosine I K. And that's the let's call it Cantor Delta. I'm kidding. Um <clears throat> so in this particular case. Um, I is repeated, so it's gonna be sum over I, <coughs> cosine theta, I, 
uh, j i k uh, it's the Kronecker delta and this one is the equation that we derived last time so sometimes you know you had the squared over here and it was equal to one otherwise it was equal to zero okay so let's this is we're gonna um, switch gears slightly Another way we can express the linear transformation is this three. The prime, these are the prime ones. So here we're gonna put one one, one two, one three, two one. Two, 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 three, three, one, three, two, three, three, what goes over here? So now we can focus on these guy over here, its name is um, transformation matrix. So we know um, that with the cosines, this works, but the cosines are not unique. You can have, well, I don't know if an infinite number of transformations, but certainly more than one uh, that satisfy you know, the system of equations. So if we focus on the two-dimensional case, so let's forget about this um, x3 prime so that we can see the details. We have our system over here, and we are going to we're going to rotate it. I don't know how to. Okay, I'm going to use the red one. So this is the unprime system, and then we're going to have the prime system. Okay. So the angles. This one is one, 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 one. And this one is theta two, two. Is it? Um, actually, I'm gonna move it. I'm gonna use this one. This one is Two. This one is X2, X1, X1 prime, X2 prime. So it goes from the prime one to the unprime two. This one goes from the prime one to the unprime one. Okay, we're gonna call this one um, phi. So then this angle over here is also phi. So we can rewrite
x1 prime is x1 cosine theta 1 1 plus x2 cosine theta 1 2. We theta 1 1 equals phi. This is going to be x1 cosine phi and theta 1 2 this one is going to be equal to pi over 2 which one is the, the phi and which one is this one is phi is equal to 1, 1. So how can be all equal? Like what's what do you mean? The best, what's the best case for an pi or pi from the Cartesian? Well, they're not all equal. Let me, let me finish this one. So this one is 1, 2 is pi over 2. So 90 degrees minus this one. Right? So this one and this one is going to be 90 degrees. Wait, is that? No. Um, this one is a 90 degrees. Yeah, so this one is 90 degrees. degrees minus this one. Okay, so uh, we can rearrange. So phi is pi over 2 minus theta 1 2 and so cosine of theta 1 2 is going to be the sine of pi over 2 minus theta 1 2. So this is just the uh, relationship between cosine and sine. And this is equal to sine phi. So then this one is x2 sine phi. So, what was your question? Because this is rotating it, you're rotating it, and this, this, this is a orthogonal, so you move it like this. So this angle is equal to this angle. More like orthogonal. Hmm? More like orthogonal. They're not what? They are not open. They are just one of the same. I don't understand the question. So this is 90 degrees. Yes? You rotate the whole thing. So if you move this one by this much, you know, you move this one by the same amount. I got, I don't know if yeah, I can ex. I think the angle between x2 and x1 is also 90 degrees, right? Uh, which one? X2 prime and X1 prime. X2 prime, prime, prime and X1 prime. X2 prime and X1 prime. Will be 90 degrees. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're orthogonal. Yeah. Okay, so we have that relationship and we are running out of time. So the other one 
is the same idea, um, but it's going to be x1. Um, we can write the cosine cosine to 1 plus x2 cosine to 2 and if we want to write it as phi it's going to be uh, minus x1 sine phi plus x2 cosine phi. Uh, it's the same idea, so I guess I'm just going to write it here very quickly. Um, cosine 2, 1 is going to be equal to sine 90 degrees minus 2, 1. This one is sine of minus phi. And this is an even function, so we take the negative out, so it's minus sine of phi. This is where this negative comes from. Okay, so now we can write um, transformation matrix in terms of this stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it over here. It's gonna be cosine phi, sine phi, zero, I guess the A130, minus sine phi, cosine phi, zero, and this is just the z-axis, okay? So we can write the transformation matrix in terms of the cosines 1, 1, 1, 2, and so on. Um, but we can also, you know, making this um, equal to phi, we can express the whole thing in terms of one parameter. So in two dimensions, how many independent parameters do you need for a transformation? One. Which is five. What about in three dimensions? Two. Uh -huh. Two. So in three dimensions, we have you know, nine of the equations, but many of them are going to be um, repeated, right? So we ended up with how many uh, parameters last time? Three. So six of the equations were essentially saying the same thing. So let's see how that looks in two dimensions. case is just for one and two. This is in two dimensions. And so we're going to get four equations. You know, for three dimensions, we get nine. For two, we get for one, one, which is equal to one, the definition of the Kronecker delta. So it's going to be a one, one, a11 one, one. then <coughs> is a sum over all indices 
Um, so the one that is the same is one. The next one that is not repeated is gonna be two. So this one is two, one, two, one. Then we have one, two. This one has to be equal to zero. And it's gonna be one, 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 two. Two, one, two, two. This one, the next one will be two, one. It's also equal to zero. And it's gonna be one, two, one, one. Two, 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 one. And the last delta is two, two. This one is equal to what? One, and the terms are gonna be one, two, one, two, 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 two. But if you look at this equation, it is actually the same one. So these terms are switch, but it's a multiplication, so it doesn't matter if they're switch. Um, if the indices are switched, then that's a different thing. But they're not, they're the same. One, 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 two, one, two. Two, one, two, one, two, 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 two. So this is the same equation. So we have um, we have four parameters. or I guess four unknowns. And we have three equations. Okay, so we need one independent parameter to actually be able to define this thing. That independent parameter is gonna be phi. Okay, so I got the wrong marker. Okay, this one's better. So I guess I, I can put it over here. I'm going to delete the X2. Sorry, erase. <laughs> Using the computer too much. This one is term one one, so cosine phi, and two one is this one, right? So sine phi. So we have that one is equal to cosine square phi plus sine square phi. Is that right? So the one in the middle is cosine phi sine phi minus sine phi Cosine phi. So cosine phi minus is that true? Yeah. yeah. And for the third one gonna be sine square squared phi plus cosine squared phi. Okay, so do we comply with the orthogonality conditions? Yes. 
So everything seems to be self-consistent. So for uh, matrices, I'm gonna be using this notation. So this is the transformation matrix A. So it's A tilde. Uh, for the most part, I can, using this notation, be consistent with the book. Um, there's one part where I'm gonna have trouble because they use A tilde for the, uh, the transpose. So for the transpose, I'm gonna use A tilde uh, T or I guess capital T. But other than that, uh, we should be fine. So I was talking at the beginning about how this has two interpretations. You, know, you can be rotating the vector or you can be rotating the system. So the first one I guess if you're rotating the system, we can write that as vector r. And then the parenthesis means that it is the same vector, it's not changing. That's equal to a tilde R vector. So in this case, we are rotating the, uh, the system. <coughs> the other idea. So for this here, R is going to be the same, so it will be the bulk. Um, could you repeat that? Like, like when you were looking at this, you revolve, like when you revolve the vector. It is revolving. Uh huh. You're going to revolve it, and you should come back with the same. Oh, yeah. So if you plug in um, 2 pi over here, what do you get? You plug it into. So 2 pi will be like uh, the whole rotation, right? Yeah. So this one will be. Uh, well, let me draw it. So this is sine, and this is cosine. So for sine is zero, and for cosine is one. So it would be one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. Pretty, no? So this is the identity matrix, of course. So you just multiply, well, you're rotating it by 360 degrees, but that means that you live in the same place. Um, so the other way is you rotate the vector. Um, the other one. So this one is R prime. Uh, it's equal to A tilde. R vector R. So A in the matrix is an operator. Um, so it can operate on the system or it can operate on the vector. Unfortunately, uh, the algebra is exactly the same. So the math is exactly the same. So there is really no way to differentiate. So it comes from the context, right? So someone, I guess, in the paper that you're reading or in the problem that you're trying to solve, you will know which one it is. But they are equivalent. The math is the same. Um, okay, so 
I guess the first one, you can express it as same vector but you're changing the system this one will be r goes to r prime and this one is going to be x cosine phi plus y sine phi in still in i because you're rotating the vector in the system um, sine i negative plus cosine still in j because you're rotating the vector in the system but you know, mathematically, they're going to be the same. OK, so let's spend five minutes on the next thing. <laughs> So this one was section 4.2. Section 4.3 is about, um, I guess, the formal math. They call it formal properties. So essentially, you just go through the properties of matrices and then apply them to uh, this Kronecker delta stuff, the orthogonality conditions. So let's look at the first one. If you apply two transformations sequentially, So B tilde is XK, well, implies XK prime equals B KJ XJ. The vector r prime is going to be b tilde vector r, and then we have another one which will be a tilde. This will be x i. And this is double prime, so we're applying it twice. And this xk prime, we have it over here. Um, so this transformation is going to be r prime double prime a tilde r prime, this one. So this one we can write it as xi prime prime. I, K, um, then we can just put this one over here. B, 
k j x j but you know this is just a product so we can write it as c i j x j but this is just a regular linear transformation so if we define C tilde as A tilde, B tilde, we have R double prime equals C tilde R. This is, these are vectors. So pretty simple. If you apply linear transformations in succession, that's your linear transformation. All right, we're gonna go over the rest of the properties next time.